So I'm very, very happy to be here. And as Italian, of course, I have to say that uh, my talk probably will be again about grannies. I don't know why, <laughs> as Italians, we, we love grannies, but uh, this is part also of my story of my biography as, uh, as a scholar, as an ethnobiologist. And that's why, um, actually, when uh, René invited me here, I thought I had to be really um, true. And I will, I will try to explain what nine friends, I, I love them, and I have loved them, a few of them passed away, taught me. Because at the end of the day, as an ethnobiologist, uh, um, we have not put much salt on our own in the soup. But we have met people, they have taught us, um, and they have, um, they have really had a remarkable role in teaching uh, the amount of salt and, of course, the variety of salt to be put uh, in the soup. So basically, nine friends. Um, you see strange names from different parts of the world. I would like to begin with two very important uh, fathers and mothers of the ethnobiology, Daryl Posey and, and Nina Etkin. Passed away a few years ago, but these two persons um, were very important in uh, bringing me to this idea that uh, science has to make a step down. <laughs> science has to establish a dialogue with uh, the local communities, because the local communities and their traditional knowledge maybe know much more than we know. And, uh, in general idea, there was this wonderful um, expression to say that uh, culture and nature are very linked. There is an inextricable link, a mysterious link between culture and nature. And of course, Daryl was uh, very important in my life for letting, letting me appreciate the spiritual value of biodiversity. Biodiversity is not about plants and animals only. It's about the ways we look at them. And these ways we look at them, the way we perceive plants and animals and the environment is sometimes very, very important, much more important than probably our uh, sisters and brothers in the biodiversity world. And of course, the need for a transdisciplinary and human science. We will come back to this, and uh, I wanted just to begin to say thank you to these two persons. They, they are not more among uh, us, but they gave me a lot. And as I told you, as Italian, grannies again. These are three marvelous old women from a very tiny little village in southern Italy, inhabited by Arbresh. The Arberesh are descendants of Albanians. And these three women, in different ways, have changed the way how I, um, I had in my mind uh, um, the botany. When uh, I began to do this work, I thought there is a plant kingdom, of course, and this plant kingdom, as it is taught in many university classes, uh, is... Uh, uh, classified, is categorized according to uh, families. These two, um, three old ladies told me instead for many, many days that their idea of classifying plants is, is very different. And actually, they had a category for a specific group of plants which included the idea of edibility, yakra. Yakra cannot be translated in the scientific language. They are the plants, they grow in environments, they are pretty disturbed by, uh, by the human beings, and they can be eaten. And they were eaten. They were gathered, they were blanched, they were generally, uh, and they are still, fried with olive oil and chilies. So the category of Yakra is something we do not know in the science. Uh, and that brought me to this uh, strong feeling that the, um, 
the Weltanschauungen we have in the science are not enough. To establish this dialogue between uh, science and traditional knowledge is not an easy job. And for all of us uh, ethnobiologists, the first important and difficult story is to try to translate what a specific vernacular term means a term referred to a plant. And the first important problem we have is that the one-to-one -one correspondence never exists. Many times, people may name different plants with the same vernacular term. Is that wrong? No, it's very right. Because according to their idea of plants, they may exist plants, they have similar taste or they have pungent taste, or they may be used in similar ways. For example, um, in southern Italy, in this village, Marshworth, which is a wild plant, uh, um, which test is uh, very um, close to the test of celery, and watercress are named with the same term. Is that wrong? No, it makes perfectly sense. Um, and even the mental map of plants that people have in traditional cultures is very different from what we have in the books of botany. Um, for example, amaranth and uh, uh, fat hen. They are generally named in the same kind of, uh, of, of, of label because they are used in similar ways. And much more interesting is that uh, these mental maps of, ma of, of plants depend very heavily from where the plants are gathered. They are, in other, in other words, uh, mental maps. Uh, they uh, consider the ecology of these plants. The botany is not so far yet. And that's why I think we need, uh, um, we need to learn. We need to listen, to listen. Botanists and probably many scientists around the world, too much time, they, in the past they went in different places in the world and they pretended to know things. But actually what we should do is to listen, and then listen again. This is a very interesting feature of the ethnogastronomy in this village. Um, People, according to the bitterness of plant, classify plants as food or medicine. And there is a very interesting stuff which is in between um, different species of tasseliacinth. Um, they are consumed because they are believed to be very healthy. Nowadays, we know from the pharmacologists that these plants are the most antioxidative plants we have in Europe. And they are still consumed according to this um, folk knowledge system. Traditional knowledge systems, then, are profoundly embedded in the local landscape, in the language, in the history. We cannot really divide. This is culture, this is nature. It's just a result of the co-evolution, the fact that in these gastronomies we use certain things for reaching certain aims. The fourth person I would like to talk about is uh, another very important teacher for me, is uh, one of the last sworn virgins um, living in a very isolated area in Albania, Justina Duni, in one of the most untouched, probably, place uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, um, and uh, they are the people that have been always pastoralists. They uh, use their plants according to very unique features. For example, Justina um, taught me that uh, Salep, the tubers from wild orchids, may be a wonderful and delicious food in the winter when the people, and especially the kids, feel, uh, feel weak. Justina has taught me that uh, even a nettle or beech soup has a dignity and has to be respected not only when other members of the family eat it, but when animals eat it. This um, is, is in fact a soup which is prepared only for the cows. And then, only in this way, the cows, according to the knowledge of Justina, 
may produce a delicious milk which will then fit in all magnificent dairy products uh, for which these mountains are very famous. But Justina told me also another important uh, story, that the traditional knowledge changes, evolves, is not just static, is not just traditions. Traditions are made by continuous evolutions, innovations, and actually, after the communism in northern Albania, people went back to Gada Salep and other plants much more than they, they, they were used to do during the communism. So in a kind of magic way, traditional knowledge was uh, revitalized. Why? Because, of course, um, during uh, the post-communism uh, in the mountains, many problems arise, public health um, problems, uh, arrived and delivery of care was very, very difficult. So that told me that traditional knowledge is the result of a continuous co-evolution between human beings and, uh, uh, and what we call nature. The last uh, two friends in this session I would like to talk about are two friends, they come from very different world. Olga is a Russian-German who migrated back to Germany a few years ago after the family lived in, Ger in, in Russia for more than 250 years, back migration. And Rosa Lizica is one of the last Venetians living in Eastern Romania in a wonderful, lively um, um, landscape uh, close to the Danube. These two wonderful women taught me that even the representation of traditional knowledge may change over time. Of course, they could uh, remember, and they still do, of course, uh, um, the marmalade, uh, the jam with uh, the flowers of dandelion, uh, wonderful uh, uh, sweets uh, from uh, sorrel leaves, uh, and not to forget, of course, the lacto-fermented uh, vegetables. Uh, uh, they could be actually probably very useful this evening after the, the, the European Championship uh, match because uh, the water is considered very, very healthy against uh, um, drunkness. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the lessons I learned from these two ladies was that uh, even Traditional knowledge is a fact, is experiential, is very much represented. That means uh, we talk probably about things we are attached to in different ways depending on the person we have in front of us. So in one word, the traditional knowledge, and you of course as chefs know this better than me, is a narrative, is a way of representing an experience. And then is a way through which we negotiate our identity. So, where, where do you go from here? I think, and that is uh, actually funny because I wrote this before coming here, and yesterday evening I was thinking that what we have experienced so far, yesterday we had a wonderful day with uh, Rene and the other friends, is uh, part of what uh, I drafted as, as a dream. What is important is to feed our appetite for biocultural diversities. And to celebrate these diversities, we need platforms like the ones we are now. Thank you very much, Rene, for building such an essential platform. Too often, scientists live in a tower and, uh, of course, uh, many of other stakeholders live in another world. We need a platform where we can talk together. And I think it's so important that we can share our experiences, we can share our knowledge. Other important point, in my opinion, education. We need, desperately need, of platforms through which we can educate young people and we can re-educate each other. We live in a time of crisis, of problems, and I think to build these networks will also facilitate the building 
the so-called resilience, which is uh, very much needed in this time. Resilience is a very nice word, but actually in practice is what local communities in many parts of the world have really, have really generate every day. And then let me go back to the idea of Daryl Posey about the spiritual value of biodiversity. When we talk about food, when we talk about knowing how to manage a natural environment, at the end of the day, we talk about care. Food providers, shepherds, farmers are care providers. And we need to care, I think, very much each other in order to appreciate this value, which is the, probably the most interesting essence of biodiversity. What this may mean in our society at large, for scientists, for chefs, for foodies, I don't know. But I think we need to find space and time from, for these platforms, because these are very, very important. And then we come to my last friend, my last uh, and probably most important and mysterious friend, Levi, one of the wise elders of the, one of the First Nations uh, on the Vancouver Island in Canada. I spent many, many days with him alone in the middle of the forest and talking about biocultural diversity many, many times, he, he told me, you know, at the end of the day, Andrea, this is your concept. It's the concept of the people, they come from the Western culture, they think biology, nature and culture were divided, and that's why they need to build new words. But actually, he was keeping me saying, what you express, we would express in another way. We would just say, Ishukish Savalk, everything is one, everything is connected. And since everything is one, I think we can also say we are all one. Thank you very much. Andre. Okay, uh, stand here, Andre, stand here. Uh, some lights and some, any questions for uh, Andre? We've got a question here. Not about the football, hopefully. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, do you believe this is uh, not kind of, kind of risky to try to melt uh, uh, science with the, this uh, knowledge? I, I don't know if... No. As a, as a scientist. As a scientist, I yes. think we need to be open-minded and to recognize that in a specific domain, I don't want to say in, in many things, but in many domain, the science has not um, given the most final word. We need to learn from the people they have uh, lived together with the nature for centuries and millennia. Because without this kind of experiential knowledge, also our creativity and innovation is very mutilated. So in my opinion, um, that does not far mean the science should do another, another job. Everybody has to, has to continue to do its, its job, but we need a dialogue. We need finally a dialogue. Because uh, let's be honest, all these delicious products you probably use in your cuisine comes from farmers, comes from fishermen, as we have seen this morning. They have the knowledge, and they have a knowledge which is probably not embedded in the agronomy and botany books we have in our universities. And that's why you have, I think, you folks have a, an amazing role in, in, in trying to build uh, this platform and to reconciliate this different kind of knowledge. At the end of the day, probably, let me say, traditional knowledge and science, uh, they are fruits from the same tree. This is beautiful, but they are different fruits, and we need to appreciate one fruit and the other together. 
Sorry, Dot, but I believe that um, this kind of uh, thought uh, creates some kind of aberration. When you think about uh, to melt two different concepts, then you got something like is uh, biodynamics. I got once again to this concept, but I think you, you cannot, uh, in, in our time, you cannot think that you, you can uh, do science and uh, grow vegetables and, uh, and think that the stars can influence this process. I think it's, it's very risky to, to give this, uh, uh, this message to the people. Well, to begin a work that has been never done is challenging. There are, of course, bottlenecks. We cannot go now in details. There are many bottlenecks, but it's a work, in my opinion, that is uh, urgently needed. OK, uh, any more questions? Uh, Andre talked about the importance of having a platform to share ideas and talk, so that's what we should be doing. Andre, ethnographers are often in a race to capture and record a culture and preserve it before it disappears. Can you give us your view on the cultures that you're looking at, their strength, their ability to survive in, a, in an evolving world, and also how we pass on that knowledge so that you know, it doesn't get lost? Well, this is also our responsibility because we have built the wrong idea that we have all answers. We have built a, a, a faked idea in front of uh, local communities, they had historical, much less power in the world, that we can solve everything. So I think we have also the responsibility to work together with the local knowledge in addressing the problem of, of the transmission. We need to reinstill this knowledge. We need, of course, to marry this knowledge with the modern science, with innovation. I think uh, um, we cannot escape from this responsibility. And, and, and many communities uh, all over the world, I think, are more and more aware now of uh, um, this kind of subtle, interstitial, but delicious, uh, um, uh, rich uh, value they have. Let's think about the languages. Languages are music, and we are losing languages every day uh, more than we lose plants. But of course, since we are, uh, what we are, who we are, in the, in, especially in the past decades, we tend to look at more at things, but not at music. So I think we, we have a responsibility. We cannot leave all in the hands of local communities. They are very often marginalized. Okay, one uh, last question, quick question, and a short answer. Where's our question? Okay, right at the top. And a short answer, please, yeah. Andre, thank you. I'm not sure if it's a short answer. Uh, not long ago, I, I sat in a, a meeting of chefs uh, who were told that science needed to come into the kitchen much more, that, that, that the kitchen was a place of wives' tales and, and false knowledge. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, if it is really communication and not knowledge, the language of, that these two different groups speak that is the issue, and if so, how you, if you could quickly suggest a way to communicate better amongst ourselves. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I think that um, actually we need to, to go out from our towers. This is the main point. Because it is true that, uh, of course, uh, science uh, should enter into the kitchen. I would like to say, and uh, uh, believe me, this is not just uh, to, uh, to make you happy, that I would like to see more farmers and chefs within the universities. I think that we need to, to go out from our towers. Very strong. Because at the end of the day, knowledge is not just uh, a body of, of, of something that is uh, just theory. Not, knowledge has to be embedded with practice. And you are the real, let's say, expert of practice. You are the heroes of practice. So I think you can understand probably much more than me and than scholars how this dialogue has to happen. But of course, it is a very open task. I don't have any recipe, exact recipe, in my pocket.